Summer deluge continues. Hundreds of calls for help across New South Wales with heavy rain and possible flash flooding on the way. Meanwhile, the Northern Territory also bracing for more heavy rainfall and damaging winds as the top end monsoon sets in. We are live from Darwin. Police raid. Child abuse detectives search a house owned by the Catholic Church in Western Australia as part of a long-running investigation into sexual assault allegations. Another missile fired at a US-owned ship off the coast of Yemen as British Prime Minister warns the UK won't hesitate to retaliate against further attacks. Also today, Naomi Osaka's return to Grand Slam tennis ends with a straight sets defeat while Australian Alex Dimonor continues his strong form. Hold on a second. Do he curbs? He's got his walk curbs? in. He's got Oh, my God. This well, is going to stink, folks. No, it's Brisbane. Oh. And, and we step into the world of geo-guessing and meet someone who can pinpoint a location anywhere in the world from a single picture. Welcome back on this Tuesday morning. You're watching News Breakfast. The New South Wales State Emergency Service has responded to hundreds of calls for help over the past 24 hours, with heavy rain lashing parts of the state. Residents in the already sodden northeast of the state are now being warned to brace for flash flooding with isolated thunderstorms forecast. It comes after areas near Coffs Harbour recorded falls of more than 300 millimetres over the past day. Reporter Helena Burke joins us now from SES headquarters in Randwick in Sydney. Helena, good morning. So take us through what's happened in New South Wales over the past day. Well, Michael, over the past 24 hours, the SES has responded to more than 300 incidents. And that includes things like leaking roofs, fallen trees and other storm-related damage. Sydney, the Blue Mountains and the Central Coast experienced heavy rainfall yesterday. The Bureau of Meteorology recorded 152 millimetres of rain at the Hawkesbury. At Castle Hill in Sydney's north, a large tree fell onto a house, causing significant damage. The SES is warning that that severe weather is now moving north. North. During this afternoon and this evening, 100 to 200 millimetres of rain is expected to fall in parts of the New South Wales mid-north coast and northern rivers regions. People in those areas are being warned to brace for potential flash flooding. Because it is the school holidays, there are some concerns that people might be camping around rivers in those areas or they're generally just not very familiar with their surroundings. Because of this, the SES is urging people to stay up to date with any flash flooding warnings. Don't camp in low-lying areas and never drive through floodwaters. Helena Burke, thank you. Heading to the top end now, where some areas have received one-third of their monthly rainfall in the past 24 hours. Reporter Miles Holbrook Walk joins us now from Darwin. Miles, good morning. So how are people handling this wild weather? Good morning to you, Emma. Well, thankfully at the moment here in Darwin, not a lot of rain around this morning. Falls have been well under 10 mils, which is a welcome change from the last few days, which have been wet and wild. People have been getting soaked and even going to some of the more popular wild weather watching points of the top end, including the Nightcliff Jetty, where massive waves were crashing over a part of a beachhead where people would often be able to walk along that beach. Not so this weekend as the monsoonal low has come through and delivered massive falls. Now, in Darwin, this tropical low hasn't actually crossed over. It's just affected nearby areas, and with that brought significant onshore rainfall. Places like Watt Air in the West Daly receiving more than 400 mils. Thankfully, no evacuations yet for there and no significant flooding or homes damaged. There have been some roads that have seen uh, sinkholes formed uh, across the top end. And indeed, this time of the year, it's not uncommon for some roads to close, particularly in remote parts of the Northern Territory. But overall, people enjoying a cooler break to what has been a very long and hot build-up this season summer up here, Emma. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. So what are we expecting today and right across this week, Miles? 
So this system, tropical low, is moving eastwards and south slowly. It is bringing some minor flood warnings for the Victoria River. Now, that's significant because the community of Kalkaringi had to be evacuated in 2023 in March, where people had to leave immediately and were taken to Darwin. There's only a minor flood warning in place, and the community and people I've spoken to from there are feeling uh, a lot more assured of their preparations this year round. With that will come significant rain for other major centres south of Darwin, including Catherine, as well as the smaller township of Elliot. And that will continue right up until the weekend, a very, very low, in fact, less than 5% chance of a tropical cyclone. So the Bureau just wanting people to be alert, but not alarmed. Uh, good advice, Miles. Thank you. To other news now, a worker has died in a vehicle-related incident at the BMA Sirija mine in the Bowen Basin in central Queensland. All BMA sites stopped overnight to conduct safety checks after the fatal incident. All except Sirigi have now restarted. The United States military says Houthi rebels have struck a US-owned and operated container ship off the coast of Yemen. The Iran-backed Houthis have been attacking cargo ships in the Red Sea since November, but haven't yet claimed responsibility for this latest strike. It comes as British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says the UK won't hesitate to take further action against the Houthis to bolster security in the Red Sea. Foreign Minister Penny Wong has landed in Jordan, where she's expected to advocate for a sustainable ceasefire between Israel and Gaza. As part of the week-long visit to the Middle East, Senator Wong will meet with survivors and families of Israeli hostages. She hasn't committed to visiting the sites of the October 7 attacks, despite growing pressure from the opposition. The minister will also meet victims of Israeli settler violence in the occupied West Bank. A nine-year-old boy has survived a crocodile attack in remote Northern Territory. He's now in a critical but stable condition in Darwin Hospital after suffering puncture wounds while swimming at Kakadu National Park on Saturday. Gas giant Santos has won a legal challenge to push ahead with plans to build an underwater pipeline as part of an offshore project north of Darwin worth nearly $6 billion. Santos was forced to pause work in November after Tiwi Island's elders argued the company had not adequately addressed underwater cultural heritage sites and sacred dreaming places. But the federal court ruled the applicants failed to provide enough evidence of the potential impacts of the pipeline on cultural heritage. Nauru is severing diplomatic ties with Taiwan and will no longer recognise Taiwan as a separate country but as part of China's territory. It's the first country to switch allegiance since the election of a pro-sovereignty sovereignty president in Taiwan over the weekend. Nauru's government says it's now seeking to resume diplomatic relations with China. The move leaves Taiwan with 12 diplomatic allies. And the 75th Emmys get underway in Hollywood later today with multiple Australians nominated for their television acting performances. Sarah Snook is a leading contender for Best Drama Actress for her role in Succession. That show leading the pool with a massive 27 nominations. Fellow Aussies Murray Bartlett and Anna Torv are both up for Best Guest Acting in a Drama for their roles in HBO zombie drama The Last of Us. Several Aussies have also been nominated in technical categories. All the action gets underway from midday Australian Eastern Daylight Time. Let's go to sport and it was quite a night at the Australian Open running. Oh, it definitely was, Michael. Some good and mm. some bad parts. Naomi Osaka's return to Grand Slam tennis has ended with a straight sets defeat, while Australian Alex Dimonor is continuing his strong form. Osaka, a two-time champion at Melbourne Park, has gone down to French 16th seed Caroline Garcia, 6-4-7-6. It was the 26-year-old's third match since returning to tennis following the birth of her first child in July last year. Alex Dimonor, though, has had success through to the second round of the tournament following the retirement of Milos Raonic due to injury in their match last night. He says he's still enjoying every moment of play despite the early end to the match. It's a, a blessing uh, starting the year in Australia, playing in front of my home fans and... I don't really associate playing in Australia as nerve-wracking or more pressure. In fact, I associate it as just excitement. No pressure on him to do well <laughs> no. in this tournament 
from us, but hey, yeah. fingers crossed. He strikes me as a pretty cool collected customer at the best of times, mm. Alex Demon, all despite all the pressure on him, clearly. Absolutely, he does. And I mm. think that sort of translates through into his tennis, it, doesn't it? It does. The way he plays. Yeah, so yeah. Good luck to him. Good luck to him indeed, Ronnie. Thank you so much. Let's check out weather. Nate. Lots of action on the court, lots of action in the skies, although Melbourne's been pretty clear and that remains the case today. It is pretty windy this morning, but I'll find 30 degrees to come. But we have plenty of wild weather to talk about. For the capitals, it'll be showers in Brisbane, 29, 27 in Sydney, and Canberra's getting to 23. Just a couple of falls for you. Hobart looking for a clear 29 today, 33 in Adelaide, 41 is in the west for Perth as that city bakes. And then up north, Darwin, you're only getting to 31. More storms and heavy falls potentially. We've got warnings in place this morning in the southeast, in New South Wales, across the River Rena for a line of thunderstorms providing heavy to intense rainfall this morning. Flash flooding a real concern. The other major warning is on through the Territories north and for parts of the west of the NT as well. Heavy falls, damaging winds here, courtesy of a low pressure system that's embedded in the monsoon trough. It's also not only drenching the north of the country, but it's spawned a Category 1 cyclone, Angrek, uh, over near the Cocos Keeling Islands. We'll watch that system closely. It's really not moving very quickly at all right now. Back home, plenty of thunderstorm activity through large parts of the east and the south, even central Australia. Some cooler southerlies coming in are helping to flush out some of the heat we've had over in the west and central parts of the country. But it's still pretty warm in WA and extreme fire danger is following for parts of WA. We're likely to see more thunderstorm warnings, more heavy falls through the day today. Team, I'll take you through the outlook a little later in the hour. Thanks, Nate. Well, 450,000 people could be calling up their GP soon to get a prescription for a vape. New health department analysis shows the strain the healthcare system could be under once the ban on vapes comes into full effect later this year. For more, we are joined by President of the Royal College of General Practitioners, Dr Nicole Higgins. Dr Higgins, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Good morning. So almost half a million people are you surprised by that number? Uh, it demonstrates the problem that vaping has become and especially for our children and our adolescents. And I think it's really important to remember that we have lots of tools in our toolkit about how to get people off vapes and, and cigarettes. And it's not going to happen over, overnight. This is going to drip through over the next few months. So the impact on the health system isn't as bad as what it may, may appear. So can G so you're saying GPs can handle this amount of people because we're hearing that it could be um, about a million GP visits. Yeah, so GPs, this is part, part of what we already do and it's uh, bread and butter is helping people get off nicotine. And that's what's happened. We've created a new generation of nicotine addicts through vaping where 90% of the disposable vapes that are being sold contain nicotine. And... What we need to think about is how do we best get people off that? We know that counselling through your GP and other resources such as Quitline and the over-the-counter resources such as you know patches and gum, etc., can help people to quit vaping and quit cigarettes. Talk us through some of the, the things that people can do. So if they go to their GP, what can they expect um, if they want to get off cigarettes and go on to vapes as a tool for them to get off these cigarettes? Yeah, so we we want to set people up for success, and that means having a look at assessing how addicted to the nicotine they are. What's the best option for that? Sometimes it will be using prescribed vapes and other nic uh, other nicotine replacement therapies such as patches, etc. So it is also then about bringing in other those resources such as Quitline, and then ongoing monitoring and support because, as people know. Uh, this is a real psychological battle. Getting over uh, stopping smoking and getting over vaping is really challenging and can't always do it on your own and you can do it with your GP and we'll get you through to the other end. Nicole, when people hear figures like, you know, a million GP visits, 450,000 people needing to go to the GP um, and then they hear about cost, are you worried that people won't bother that they, they'll hear those figures and go, oh, it's going to be too hard to get into a GP or it's going to cost me too much, that that's going to be a barrier for them? Yes, nine out of ten people see their, their family doctor every year and those GP visits, you know, despite uh, what's being said, are very accessible. We know that most people can get in within, 
you know, one or two days of seeing their doctor. And we know that if you're going to get over um, a nicotine addiction, we need to plan for this. Also, our bulk billing rate is up around 80%. And the cost of vaping and the cost of replacement therapies, it's much better to do it through a GP prescription. It's cheaper than the ongoing costs of cigarettes or vapes. Dr Nicole Higgins, thank you very much for joining us on News Breakfast. Good morning, thank you. Police in Western Australia have searched a house owned by the Catholic Church in Broome amid a long-running investigation into sexual assault allegations. The ABC understands the house is where Broome's former Catholic Bishop Christopher Saunders lived until late last year. An independent report commissioned by the Vatican described him as a sexual predator, though Bishop Saunders has denied any wrongdoing. Erin Park has the latest from Broome. The ABC received a tip-off at about lunchtime on Monday that a large number of WA police officers were converging on this property here in a quiet suburban street in the Kimberley town of Broome. Police officers were here. There were a total of about seven vehicles right through the afternoon. Fair bit of activity at some points carrying boxes, storage containers into the property. The ABC understands the house is owned by the Catholic Church, specifically the Diocese of Broome. And uh, we understand that this um, search is linked to the ongoing investigation into the former Bishop of Broome, Christopher Saunders. Now, Christopher Saunders has repeatedly denied any wrongdoing, but he has been the focus of a fair bit of discussion and investigation in recent years. He's been a cleric in the remote Kimberley region as both a priest and uh, the bishop for almost five decades. But it's been in the last four years that there's been a, a lot of turmoil within the diocese. That is because in early 2020, allegations of sexual misconduct first became public. They were made by young Indigenous men from here in the Kimberley region. Now, after after those allegations of sexual misconduct were made public in early 2020, several things occurred. A WA police investigation was launched but closed without any charges being laid. Bishop Christopher Saunders actually resigned his position and the Vatican in Rome actually commenced an independent inquiry into uh, his time running the Broome Diocese. Now that was leaked to the media late in 2023, made international headlines and it outlined some uh, concerns about financial mismanagement, again the allegations of sexual misconduct and also mistreatment of staff that had worked under him here. WA police have since confirmed they have started a fresh investigation into the former bishop and we understand that the search of this property here today is the latest development I suppose in that process that has now been uh, occurring for about a four-year period. Police have confirmed that the uh, search has been done by members of the Perth-based Child Sex Abuse Unit, but they are not revealing any information about what they have found or whether any charges have been laid. Erin Park there. Australia's second largest port operator will meet with the Federal Industrial Relations Minister this week as it pushes for the government to intervene to end months of industrial action. DP World says the work stoppages have cost the economy more than a billion dollars since October and risk adding to the price of goods. Our political reporter Nicole Hegarty is in our Parliament House studio. Nicole, what is this dispute all about and what's the likely outcome of this meeting this week? Well, good morning, Emma. And this has been brewing for some time between DP World, which operates port terminals in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and Fremantle, and the Maritime Union of Australia. The union is seeking a pay rise of 16% over two years for some 1,500 of its workers. And it says that this industrial action, which was launched back in October, is about making that happen. It's seen members refuse to accept particular shipping lines and also stop work for some periods of up to two hours. Uh, it, it wants to secure that pay rise, saying that other competitors are receiving more uh, as their, their salary compared to DP World employees. And DP World says that it's been calling on the government to intervene, estimating that according to its figures, these delays have, uh, th this action has caused delays to uh, the shipping of some essential items, uh, pushing that shipping date back 
from between two to eight weeks or by two to eight weeks and has cost the economy so far more than $1.3 billion. It's saying that it's also left a backlog of more than 50,000 containers at Australian ports. Now, ACTU Secretary Sally McManus says that it is the case that other competitors, the other major port operators in Australia, are paying their staff more than DP World. The company is deliberately, in our view, not moving because they want to uh, whip up a crisis so they can get the government to, or try and get the government to intervene so they don't have to pay the workers more. And the concern here is that these delays could actually see further increases to the price of goods on shelves for Australian customers. Now, the Industrial Relations Minister, Tony Burke, is going to meet with DP World representatives later this week with hopes of some resolution. DP World wanting the minister to use his powers under the Fair Work Act to step in and bring about a resolution sooner rather than later. No indication that will happen at this time, but... Uh, it's a wait and see from here. Yeah, it certainly is. Nicole, thank you. Heading overseas and Republican voters are now just hours away from taking part in the Iowa caucus, the first big test for candidates who want to be that party's nominee at this year's US election. Polling indicates that former President Donald Trump is well in the lead, but his competitors are still jostling for support and that very important second place. Our North America Bureau Chief Jade McMillan joined us earlier from Iowa's capital, Des Moines. This is a ballroom in downtown Des Moines that's been converted into a massive media centre. That's to accommodate the hundreds of national and international news crews that flock here every four years. Now, the caucus process is different to the primaries that most US states use to vote for who they want as the presidential nominee. Primaries are more like the elections that we're used to in Australia. People arrive at politics places that are normally open all day uh, and in many cases they can postal vote. The Iowa caucus though is a lot more old-fashioned. It's essentially a series of community meetings, party-run meetings that get uh, held in hundreds of locations across the state. Places like school gyms and town halls. Uh, voters there will hear speeches from representatives of the candidates and that's uh, another one of the ways that Iowa does things differently. People can show up undecided or even have their opinion swayed at the very last minute. And that is certainly uh, part of the campaign that Donald Trump has really focused on this time around, especially compared to his campaign in 2016 when he came second. He will have uh, what is known as caucus captains at those meetings urging support. And he's even released an animated video explaining how how to vote. His main rivals though, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and former United Nations Ambassador Nikki Haley are campaigning until the very last moment. Go out and participate in the Iowa caucus. You're never going to have an, an opportunity to have your vote make more of an impact than you will tonight. I'm asking for your support. Thank you and God bless you. It's become too personal. Politics is not personal. It should be about policy. And policy should be about the fact that Americans are tired of working for government. They want government to serve the people again. That's what we're going to bring back to America. The focus has been on Iowa for months, but it will very quickly turn after today to the next state that is going to have its say, and that is New Hampshire. The results in Iowa don't really have a big impact when it comes to the number of delegates that a candidate it needs to win to secure the Republican nomination, uh, but it can have an outsized influence because it goes first in either helping someone to build momentum heading into those other states, or if they do badly, they can pretty quickly come under uh, intense pressure to withdraw. So in many ways, Iowa is all about expectations. Donald Trump could win here, but if he doesn't win by the massive margin that is being predicted at this 
this point in time, it could call into question the level of support that so many assume he has. And if Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley do end up fighting it out for second place, uh, then those results will really have a big impact on how they're positioned heading into New Hampshire. Nikki Haley at this stage does appear to be doing much better there, even perhaps uh, looking like she's catching up to Donald Trump. The polls, though, should be treated with a pretty healthy level of scepticism and they'll be put to the test for the first time in a big way this year in just a matter of hours. Indeed they will and of course there'll be full coverage and analysis of the Iowa caucus results and what they mean for this year's US presidential election across all ABC News platforms this afternoon Australian time. Let's go to sport. Here's Ronnie. Thanks Michael. Well we've been talking a lot this morning about Alex Dimonor's result and the fact that he's through to the second round. Let's take a look at how the rest of the Australians are going. Jordan Thompson will face seven seed Stefanos Tsitsipas in the second round after his five set win over countryman Alexander Vukic. Rinki Hijikata was also part of the five-set club on day two, going down to 24th seed Jan Lennard Stuf in just under four hours. Local wildcard Darius Saville went down two sets to one to Poland's Magdala Freck. Alexei Popperin has advanced through following his 6-3, 7-6, win against fellow Aussie Mark Polmans. This means he will next play world number one Novak Djokovic. And Australia's Storm Hunter is through to the second round for the first time in her career. Hobart has ended its season in the men's cricket Big Bash League with a seven-run win over the Melbourne Stars at the MCG. Batting first, Hobart finished an eight, at eight for 187 with Matthew Wade out for 63 and Ben McDermott making 50. In reply, the Stars were four for 180 at the end of their 20 overs with Bo Webster 55 not out. Both the Stars and Hobart have failed to make the finals. Australian road and time trial champion Luke Plapp says forecast heat will be to his advantage at the men's tour down under, as the men's tour down under gets underway. Plapp is up against the likes of two-time world champion and six-time Tour de France stage winner Zulian La Philippe, but the Australian says he'll be better placed to deal with temperatures in the 30s than those who've just flown in from the European winter. And English soccer clubs Everton and Nottingham <laughs> Forest have been charged with breaching the Premier League's financial rules. Both clubs have been referred to an independent commission for alleged breaches of profit and sustainability rules in their accounts for 2022 to 2023. Under Premier League regulations, clubs can lose a maximum of just over $200 million over a three-season period or around $67 million per campaign before facing sanctions. Clubs that breach those rules are at risk of a fine or a points deduction. And we've seen, obviously, Everton has already lost mm. points this season. Season, further points lost could mean a big difference oh, between yeah. where they sit right now and where they could be sitting. More yeah. to play out on that. Mm. Rani, thank you. Let's check our weather. Over to you, Nate. Morning team, we've got a bit of a change to some of the warnings. I, I don't have any in my maps yet. First of all, let's talk about the wild weather we've had over the last 24 hours. Some severe thunderstorms through Melbourne in the early hours of this morning delivering heavy falls. We've seen big totals for the northeast of New South Wales, 300 millimetres plus for some. And then the monsoon across the north with an embedded low that's really bothering the territory. Right now though, we've just had some thunderstorms picking up over the Riverina in New South Wales. This is the warning that's changed actually. It's now more widespread, including the Randra as well. I'll get that in shortly and show you by the end of the hour exactly where we're looking. But if you're in that part of the country, take care because we're talking about heavy falls, maybe intense for some. Similarly, up in the Territory, heavy rainfall along with damaging winds here, courtesy of that low in the monsoon trough. And the monsoon trough's been very active, bringing lots of rain across the north. And now also a tropical cyclone, Angrek. It's a Category 1 system, close to but not yet bothering the Cocos Keeling Islands. One to watch closely though. Back home we've had a lot of heat. Now we've got some southerly winds helping to flush out some of that hot air. Still low level heat wave conditions, severe for some, but that is on an easing trend. Good news. Doesn't mean that it's cool yet though, because heat waves are considered over several days. For now, temperatures still well into the 40s in parts of the west and with some gusty winds, extreme fire danger is following both for the Burrup and for the Capes districts in WA. This broad area of high fire danger around that with some very dangerous blazes burning at the moment. 
Today we're looking at more rain, of course, across the north, but also through large parts of the east. Unsettled weather, we're going to see lots of severe thunderstorms, and then this is all going to resolve into a band of wet and stormy weather pushing through over the next couple of days. That will provide a bit of relief from the humid conditions in the southeast, and then attention will be all on the north because this low pressure system is really going to intensify, bringing big falls for 500 millimetres for some over the coming week. For today, Queensland, your drenching continues across the north of the state. Storms in the mix too, of course. For the rest of Queensland, you could see some showers and storms, much more isolated. But then in the southwest, we've got the potential for heavy rain and damaging winds. We'll watch for warnings. Brisbane, you've got showers. It's getting to 29 degrees. New South Wales, more unsettled weather. Showers for the most part, largely in the east, more isolated in the west. And we've got storms in the mix too for all but the southeast here. Heavy falls are possible, particularly along the north coast. Sydney, you're getting showers. It's getting to 27. A couple of falls for Canberra as well, 23 there. In Victoria, wet and stormy weather through the northwest. We could see severe thunderstorms there too. We've got a chance of storms for the rest of the state as well. It's a bit windy in Melbourne, but that is backing off. Sunny and 30 degrees later. In Tasmania, it's looking pretty fine. Certainly by comparison to the mainland, you will see some light showers developing in the north and maybe an afternoon storm for the west coast. Hobart's looking like a fine 29 degrees, which is pretty warm for you. Over in South Australia, we've got showers and storms developing. Most Mostly around the borders, but you can see increasingly getting into central parts of the state through the day. That'll really resolve itself into that big line of showers and storms tomorrow. 33 for Adelaide. Watch for severe thunderstorms in the northwest corner as that stormy weather continues through the interior of WA. It's still very hot, 41 on the way for Perth. And then up north, monsoon rains for the Kimberley. And above the Devil's Marbles in the Territory, heavy falls north of Tennant Creek. Darwin, that includes you. It's getting to 31. Nate, thank you. Two people had to be cut out of their vehicles after a serious two-truck crash in Sydney's west this morning. Fire and rescue crews say the crash on Richmond Road occurred at 5.30 this morning with both drivers trapped in their separate vehicles. Residents of Jinjin, northeast of Perth, have praised firefighters for bringing three blazes in the area under control. David Weber has more. Firefighters were battling three blazes in recent days, the Jinjin Jin fire, the Chittering fire and the Bindoon fire. By Monday afternoon, all three had containment lines established, but not before two houses were destroyed. Thousands of hectares were burnt and a number of outbuildings were lost. At one point on the weekend, the town of Jinjin Jin itself was under threat. Locals praised the efforts of firefighters. So you, you just can't thank them enough for looking after the public. The fact that they built this new uh, command centre. It's been uh, a godsend and it's coming to its full usage now. Hot, dry and windy conditions are expected to continue, while storm cells in the state's southwest may bring dry lightning strikes. David Webber we reporting. Now, when it comes to maintaining a healthy brain, it's well known that avoiding smoking and too much alcohol, as well as having a healthy diet, are all very important. But there are other ways to reduce the risk of cognitive impairment that are much less understood, like socialising, getting good quality sleep and even hormone replacement therapy for women. Fiona Blackwood has the story. These women are doing two things to reduce their risk of dementia as they age. Yes, Turn them over. The first is challenging their brains with a puzzle. My grandmother used to do a lot of crosswords as well as the puzzles um, and she had a very active brain right up until she passed. Um, so yeah, that, that is something that's always in the back of my mind to keep your brain ticking over. The second is socialising. If you can actually socialise with other people while, while doing your puzzles, um, that you can reduce your anxiety levels. Socialising is incredibly important for the brain, although we don't really understand how this works. And maybe it's through release of other neurotransmitters in the brain, including oxytocin and dopamine, that enhance brain function longer term. Deep sleep is important too for activating the glymphatic system, which cleans out toxins from the brain. And a new study has found hormone replacement therapy, taken when menopause symptoms begin, may reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease in women. So that's something that's cutting edge and obviously needs to be explored in greater detail. There are other more well-known ways to prevent cognitive degeneration, like daily exercise, a healthy diet and not smoking. John Moore's mother had dementia. So she passed away quite an early age, so it's amazing the effect it has on you. You know, It's a very sad thing, sad for the person and very hard for the family. 
He's taking part in a study. So just do it as big as fast as you can. Which uses artificial intelligence to pick up subtle changes in a person's movements, Sorry, which start. could indicate early signs of neurodegeneration. Potentially many years before you might develop um, the symptoms, the obvious symptoms of dementia. If a risk is identified, participants are encouraged to consider ways to reduce it. Having a healthy vascular system, so that means physical activity, uh, looking after your blood pressure, um, obesity and so forth. Maintaining a healthy brain with age. Fiona Blackwood, ABC News. For more than 20 years, a group of hard-working volunteer woodworkers has been crafting beautiful handmade toys for kids in need at a workshop in Brisbane South. From cars to horses and figurines, each volunteer has a favourite toy to make meticulously by hand. Reporter Michael Rennie is at their workshop now and joins us with toy maker Catherine Ogg. Michael, take it away. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, Catherine and I, we've been busy uh, in between crosses. Have a look at this. Um, we'll just whip this up for you. Michael, what do you think? I pretty, think, pretty good? I yeah? think, uh, is yeah? it fair to say it's more Catherine's <laughs> handiwork than yours, Michael? <laughs> It's pretty impressive, isn't it? Um, but Catherine, um, we did, neither of us actually made this, but um, you, this is something you're aspiring to do? Yeah, absolutely. So um, this has been made by one of our expert toy makers, um, but my speed is probably around this at the moment. So I joined the Wood Turners about six, seven months ago and with very little experience, no experience really, aside from just high school manual arts. Mm. Um, and I'm, yeah, really enjoying it and just, yeah, having a really good time making toys for disadvantaged young people and people in hospital. What do you love about uh, the process of making the toys? Really, um, I think it's the medium being wood. Um, I do like to make things in fabrics and paper and those sorts of things, but I think the wood is really unique. Every single piece is different. It's um, yeah, a one-off exclusive piece because of the nature of the medium. And you work at Kids Helpline. Um, the fact that these toys get to go to sick kids in hospital, um, kids on, on palliative care, I mean, it, it, how does that make you feel? Yeah, really good. So this year we were able to donate over 50 toys to our children and families uh, programs in Deception Bay. And um, yeah, the response has been fantastic. Like the toys are just, you can tell that they're made with love and passion and young people really aspire to that. So it just makes them feel really special that somebody has put that much effort into it. And the work really starts now for, I guess, for next Christmas, which yeah. is months away. We just had Christmas, but you've got to start working now. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we're going to try and endeavour to make a thousand toys this year. It is our goal to make a thousand toys every year. So we need to recruit some more people into our toy group to help us out, make hundreds of wheels and hundreds of axles and all sorts of things. So. And we've got some of the, uh, the guys over here that have uh, supporting the, you this morning. Um, they haven't thrown anything at us yet, but they've been well behaved. <laughs> Thank you, guys. But um, um, yeah, I guess the, the environment here and, and, and working with, with, with people, I mean, what, what have you enjoyed about that? Uh, I, when I first moved, uh, came in to join the Wood Turner Society, um, one of the things they asked me is, what do you want to do? Like, what do you want to make? And I just said, I just want to learn. And that has been something that I've really been able to get from, from the people like uh, the rest of the members here at the Wood Turner Society is... Uh, learn through their different lived experiences and um, they've always been so, such a pleasure to show me how to use any of the equipment and mentor me in this space. Catherine, thanks a lot. Yeah, Michael and Emily, yeah, it's a great, it's a great uh, cause or that, that, that they actually give a lot of this away uh, to uh, sick children and to just children right across the country, really. It, uh, it is a fantastic cause indeed. Uh, Michael and Catherine, thank you both. Well, a new film starring Zac Efron tells the story of the Von Erich family of pro wrestlers and how they fought their way to fame in the 1980s. Zac and co-stars Jeremy Allen White and Harris Dickinson trained intensely for their roles. Our reporter Catherine Schulich has been speaking with Zac and Harris about the new movie. Ever since I was a child, people said my family was cursed. Mom tried to protect us with God. Pop tried to protect us with wrestling. He said if we were the toughest, the strongest, nothing could ever hurt us. How challenging was it for you to make this film? 
it's a true it's a true story and you can't believe that everything that happened to um in the story really happened to this group of people but ultimately it's it's a you know a story about one man's triumph uh over this curse that's sort of taken over his family and uh you get to watch the von eric brothers rise to um really the top of professional wrestling is the tag team and it just was all around just seemed like a really incredible adventure and i mean a great story a really great story i mean obviously physically there's a transformation in all the actors actually what was that like when you were all on set and you saw i mean how hard was it and how competitive was it to keep up that training mm -hmm. and, and do the scenes the wrestling scenes <laughs> i think when me and jeremy stepped foot on set and realized how much work zach had done we were like oh <laughs> all right we better we better we better up the game a little bit that's hilarious but no it was it was nice it was like we had a, there was a real camaraderie and support yeah it's it's uh we all walked out of there with a lot of respect for professional wrestlers man it's to mm. do that day in and out and live live that life uh you know rock star road athlete life is it's just it's just amazing what these guys do We can do anything. We're here to restore justice to the wrestling federation that our father built with his own two hands. The hands that were passed down to us. The hands that will deliver the iron clock to you. You guys actually did all those incredible wrestling moves, didn't you? <laughs> all of us, once once you get in there and once you, you know, have a couple matches and try the moves a few times, and once you kind of get your confidence, you want to be in there. I mean... Uh, we, we worked really hard. I think that's one of the things that all the actors uh, took pride in. We never really talked about it, but I know we all are proud of it at the end of the day, is uh, that we, we did all the wrestling and we jumped in there and we did all those moves. I think uh, if you watch this film, you'll have a different uh, opinion and respect for the world of wrestling. Yeah, so I'm excited. I'm excited for uh, like professional wrestlers to see the movie, you know, and I'm excited to watch mm -hmm. more pro wrestling because... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, it's it, it really is a beautiful story and there's such complexity that uh, comes along with um, being a, a pro wrestler man we have such admiration for these athletes and what they do it's cool to shed light on uh, what you know warriors and what kind of heroes these guys are outside the ring your job is to wrestle live up to that deal or we are through Whack. The Iron Claw opens on Australian cinema screens on Thursday. But we've got some breaking news for you now. A 40-year-old man has been arrested and charged after a Brisbane Woolworth store was vandalised. That happened yesterday morning. Now, Queensland police say he's been charged with one count each of willful damage and willful damage by graffiti. The man will appear in court next month. The destructive attack came after the supermarket chain's decision to stop selling specific Australia Day merchandise. Dice. Okay, Nate is back, not with the weather though, with no. something else. Sport. What? If you will. Well, what? a World Cup, believe okay. it or not. Are you someone who never gets lost? Well, this next one might just be for you then. GeoGuessr is a game where players have to pinpoint where in the world a random photo has been taken. 23 year old Oscar Pierce recently competed in the inaugural GeoGuessr World Cup and he joins us now from, you guessed it, well, did you? Adelaide. A very good morning to you, Oscar. Uh, welcome to News Breakfast. Hey, first of all, tell us what is GeoGuessr? So GeoGuess is essentially a game where you're placed somewhere randomly in the world and you have to look around at your surroundings, look at the building, the vegetation, all of what you can see around you and try to make a guess of where you think you are. The closer you get, the more points you get and that's pretty much the entire concept. Right, so we're talking about a Google uh, Street View, essentially, photo and then from there you've got to figure out exactly where you are in the world. The world's a pretty huge place. Do you ever get stuck? 
Certainly, if there's no clues around, if there's no, if you're on a dirt road in the middle of a forest, then it's always going to be tough. However, there are lots of little tricks you can use, the driving side, what the buildings look like, the sign infrastructure, all this kind of stuff uh, can really narrow down which type of country you think you're going to be in. Now, I got on GeoGuessr yesterday and had a bit of a play. I thought I was cheating when I saw an address on the back of a delivery truck. Is that, is that cheating or is that all legit? Absolutely not. Like, there are all kinds of different rounds. The rural rounds and the urban ones, you take them both. Um, so, yeah, if you find an address, that's just your good fortune. OK, tell us about this World Cup then. So, uh, this year it's even bigger than last year, but uh, what did it involve? Yeah, so basically they just brought together 24 competitors from 21 different countries and we battled it out on Google Street View trying to guess closer than the other. Basically when you're closer than the opponent then you take away their health until they run out of health and so yeah, that, that would determine who was the winner. Um, eventually the winner was the uh, Dutch competitor Consus, which I mean he is just incredible. He can really narrow down the country faster than anyone else. Um, but yeah, it was an absolute blast to take part in. Now, uh, this year's World Cup, are you going to be competing? Yes, all, th all things being equal, I should be there. And while well, last year I didn't maybe put in as much practice as I could have because I had other responsibilities, this year my full intention is to win for Australia. So we'll see. OK, so actually on practice, mm -hmm. is it just doing it over and over and over again or are you doing other things to help figure out where in the world you might be? There are many things you can do. Certainly practicing over and over is a big part of it, but also you might like you might like learn the specific phone codes of a round America or you might go and learn to read Bengali script or you cool. might you could do many different things to improve your guesses. Yeah, right. Now, anyone can have a crack at this, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. You can try out GeoGuessr for free and, um, you know, it's, it's the type of game you can just jump in. There's really no barrier to entry because as long as you can look around and make a guess, you can play. Now, I've fallen down a few YouTube holes, and I'm sure you've done the same, where mm. people aren't actually playing GeoGuessr but essentially doing the same thing and taking somebody's random photo that they've taken on holiday or something and pinning it down. Can you do that as well? Yeah, I can. I can. It's, I dedicate myself more so towards GeoGuessr, but anyone who plays a lot of GeoGuessr will be good at doing that because they'll say, oh, well, we're driving right hand side of the road, we have this type of signage which is only found in Europe, and then we have this kind of guardrail or, you know, anything like that. And, uh, yeah, you, you learn to be able to do that. Now, beyond the winnings from the World Cup that hopefully you are going to bring home for Australia, what is this setting you up for in terms of a career, do you reckon? Are, are you going to be the go-to person when we lose something in the outback? <laughs> Um, well, I definitely think that uh, I, I hope I can use my skills for good in that kind of way one day. Uh, but really, it's you know, it's it's just for the love of the it's for the love of the game at the moment. Really, um, it's just something that's so fun to learn. And uh, yeah, I don't know, it's great fun. All right. So if anybody wants to get in it, where do they have to go and try it out? Uh, Geoguessr.com is the website that we all play on. Uh, but even still, if you don't feel like doing that, you can just go down on Google Street View and have an explore around. You can learn a lot about the world that way. I really recommend it. Uh, finally, very last question. Mm -hmm. Would you call yourself a nerd? Uh, yes. Proudly? Without a doubt. Yeah, proudly, yes. Damn straight. Good, good. Me too. <laughs> hey, Oscar, thank you so much for joining us and telling us all about GeoGuessr. Uh, good luck for the World Cup. Will you come back and let us know how you go? Absolutely, Nate. Thank you very much. Brilliant champion. Thank you so much for joining us. Catch up. Give it a crack. It is, it is actually it, genuinely fun. It sounds fascinating. It I guess is. part detective work, part geography, mm -hmm. part language, part all sorts. Completely clean fun and you learn about the world without even realising that you're doing it when you give it a crack. It's, it's, it's worth it. Check it out. OK, great. Nate, thank you. Thank you. Well, Melbourne teenager Chloe says they've often felt disconnected from their native Chinese heritage. Chloe has lost language skills and describes the situation as the curse of the immigrant child moving to a new country while trying not to lose their culture. My parents speak Cantonese at home. I reply in English. I can understand some things, but it's not enough. I feel guilty for not being able to speak the language. Like, I should have tried harder to not lose my culture. I was born in the Guangzhou province of China, but lived in Shanghai. 
I moved to Australia when I was seven, and by the time I was 14, I had transferred schools eight times. Finding the balance between retaining my culture and the need to adapt is overwhelming. Is this the curse of the immigrant child? When my parents speak Cantonese, I listen closely. I find myself muttering their words under my breath repeatedly, rolling my tongue awkwardly around the tones until they sound the same. I don't know how to answer that. I'm trying, desperately, seeking ways to feel closer to where I came from. Sometimes, when my family go out for dinner, I dress in my chongsam, even if the rest of my family are wearing everyday clothes. I like how it makes me feel. It's my way of showing the beauty of our culture. Understanding where I come from helps me connect with my parents, especially when our interests and hobbies aren't always the same. Now, language comes back in bursts, like flashes of vibrant fireworks, murmured conversations filtering in from underneath my door. It still takes a while to find the right words, but I'm not going to lose this. Not anymore. And Chloe was one of the winners of the ABC's Takeover Melbourne Youth Storytelling Competition. You can check out more stories just like that one by heading to abc.net.au slash takeovermelbourne. Now, many migrants who start a new life in Australia settle in rural and regional communities, some having survived the horrors of war and persecution in their homelands. But what does the future there hold for the next generation? ABC Sports' Amanda Shalala went to Narra Court in South Australia, where she found a vibrant town full of aspiration and ambition. Hi, I'm Amanda Shalala. As a long-time sports journalist and broadcaster, I'm really passionate about celebrating the unsung heroes, the underdogs, people who don't naturally claim the spotlight that they deserve, including women, migrants and refugees, all with amazing talent and skills to share. In the past 15 years, Narra Court's undergone radical change. A large influx of newcomers has turned it into a cultural melting pot. When I see Australia, I'm very happy, look like a heaven. <laughs> and it's become a community that's creating amazing opportunities for its young people. One day, that's, that's my dream to be pilot in command for the big planes. Yeah, definitely play for the Matildas. That would be like a dream come true, yeah. <laughs> you have three gorgeous boys. What are your hopes for them and their future? Uh, to be bright, to have a bright future, because one of them want to be a prime minister. <laughs> how is this little town embracing its new communities? And how has it managed to empower its young people? I can't wait to find out. And in catch the back roads trip to Narra Court tonight at 8 o'clock on ABC TV and ABC iView. You're nodding approvingly there about Narra Court. Absolutely. As a proud South Australian. Yeah, beautiful part of South Australia. Check it out tonight. Let's go to sport. Here's running. Thanks, Michael. English soccer clubs Everton and Nottingham Forest have been charged with breaching the Premier League's financial rules. Both clubs have been referred to an independent commission for alleged breaches of profit and sustainability rules in their accounts for 2022 to 2023. Under Premier League regulations, clubs can lose a maximum of just over $200 million over a three-season period or around $67 million per campaign before facing sanctions. Clubs that breach those rules are at risk of a fine or a points deduction. South Korea has started its Asian Cup campaign with a 3-1 win over Bahrain. Lee Kang-in scored twice in the second half for the two-time champions. In other matches, Jordan has thrashed Malaysia 4-0 and Iraq has defeated Indonesia 3-1. And, of course, Australia will next take on Syria after defeating India 2-0 at the weekend.
And Argentina's Lionel Messi has retained the FIFA Player of the Year award. Messi, who also secured the award in 2022 after guiding Argentina to World Cup victory, clinched the title with PSG alongside Kylian Mbappe following that success before moving to Major League Soccer team into Miami. The 36-year-old voted the best player by national teams, coaches, captains, journalists and fans, helped Inter Miami win the 2023 League's Cup, scoring 10 goals. Messi was not present to collect the trophy, but, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure he was happy about that. Oh, oh yeah. Been over the moon. Just to add to his huge yep, trophy cabinet, absolutely. which would be overflowing, and I'm sure he doesn't even know where half these things are. It's probably why he didn't rock space. up, right? He's like, I'm going to have to find One space more. for it. Yeah. Oh, God. Right, out of the way. Ronnie, thank you. <laughs> okay, Nate. Okay. Okay. What's the latest with all the warnings? We've had big falls in the northeast okay. of New South Wales, 300 millimetres plus. Melbourne's eastern suburbs copped a severe thunderstorm overnight in the early hours of this morning. We've got heavy falls in the north thanks to the monsoon. We've got a tropical cyclone. We're still dealing with heatwave conditions and increased fire danger. And right now, some storms in the south of New South Wales. Take a look at the maps. I'm going to show you the radar. First of all, check out the northeast of New South Wales. That rain has been continuous. Here's the storm that zipped through Melbourne overnight and then now this big patch of thunderstorms that's expanded over the last couple of hours. Now they're delivering heavy to intense rainfall. So we're through the Riverina, broad warnings. This includes Narandra as well. Uh, we're, it's going to be quite a dangerous morning there. But we've also got broad warnings through the Northern Territory, the top end and then through much of the northwest. We're expecting here heavy rainfall and damaging winds courtesy of a low pressure system embedded in the monsoon soon trough. Now that's not going anywhere. In fact, if anything, it's intensifying in the coming days. Meanwhile, on the far left of the screen, the red dot there, that patch of rain is associated with another tropical cyclone that's developed. It actually developed in Indonesia's area of responsibility. It's called Tropical Cyclone Angrek. It's a Category 1 system at the moment. Meanwhile, look at the southeast. Plenty of storms on the way today. Now, the good news that we've got is that a frontal system coming through is delivering some cooler southerlies. First of all, to WA, and that's helping to flush out some of the heat that's been bothering that state. But it is still hot and dry and gusty, so extreme fire danger on in WA. Again, this broad area of high fire danger around that with some very dangerous blazes burning at the moment. One to watch very closely. The rain in the east, we're about to see a big burst for Wednesday into Thursday in southeastern Australia, showers and storms, but look at that low just bothering the Northern Territory. In the west there, you get a better look at tropical cyclone Angrek. And in the east, a low pressure system off Queensland's northeast is likely to sit in the Coral Sea, intensifying in the week ahead. But for now, it's really the territory that remains our focus. 400, 500 millimetres for many. Still lots of rain on the way in the east as showers and storms. And we'll be feeling that today. Brisbane's got a wet 29, uh, 29 degrees, 27 in Sydney showers for you and a couple of falls in Canberra as well, 23 there. Melbourne's warming up to 30. It's been a pretty gusty start to the day. That wind's backing off. Fine and 29 for Hobart. That's pretty warm for you. 33 for Adelaide. 41 in the west for Perth. Things cool down from tomorrow. And then up top, Darwin, you're getting to 31. Rain, maybe heavy falls and storms around too. OK, another busy one for you, yeah. mate. Yeah, lots of Are they anything on. but at the moment? No, that's exactly <laughs> right. Look, um, it is summer and we have been talking about heading to the beach because there was a survey by the streaming service Spotify asking Aussies, what, you, what do you think? Do you like people playing music at the beach or is this a no-no? And about 78% or so of people surveyed said they don't like it when the music's too loud. And some people even said they want segregation aggregated areas for people to enjoy the music. So we asked you what you think. Um, Gabriella sent us in a, a message saying, beaches, parks and nature should be serene so we can enjoy all its natural beauty. I agree on designated areas of peace and quiet. Well, Rani's keen on designated areas, but mm. my problem with designated areas is sound does travel. No matter how responsible you are with your mm. boom box, do we still have boom boxes? <laughs> Do we? Mm. Yes, Actually, Michael. Ronnie, do we? Yeah. Mm. Uh, not sure about that, oh, but okay, we do have Ronnie. devices that play music. Yes. Oh, right. Um, um, but music does travel. Um, Lynette says, I want to enjoy the sound of the waves, the joyous squeal of children, the quiet chatter of people relaxing, and the bark of a dog playing in the waves. I do not want to be overwhelmed by other people's music. Music tastes are so different, it's impossible to play anything that will suit 
everyone. Mm, that's a very interesting issue. We'd love having your thoughts on that. It's been another very busy show. Nate is absolutely exhausted, but he's going to be back on the news channel with all your weather updates. I could do with some designated quiet space, <laughs> yeah. to tell you what. I'm, yeah. I'm off to the beach with my Walkman. <laughs> oh, yeah, that'll do. Got one as well, haven't you? See you tomorrow. <laughs> Visit a little town in South Australia's...